which brings us to the classical world. Notwithstanding the caveats about the influence of Egypt and Persia on the Greeks, there is a sense in which that Eurocentric myth of the creation of the modern world from 5th century Athens is actually true. We have, in our focus on Egypt and Mesopotamia, ignored developments in the Mediterranean. The Minoan civilization at Knossos in Crete, though not literally destroyed by the eruption of Santorini and its tidal wave, declined around that time, but its legacy endured. And there is a link, chronologically at least, between the killing of the tyrants around the beginning of the 5th century BC in Athens, known as the Tyrannicides, and the birth of Athenian democracy, and the development of the classical tradition of art. Greek democracy, though, is almost unrecognisable as democracy to the modern mind. Only around one in ten people could vote, all of them male, all of them aristocrats. No women voted, no women left the house without covering their hair, no people born outside Athens, the metekoi, uh, could vote. Slaves, often prisoners of war, could not vote. Plato, arguably the Athenian state's most famous philosopher, argued for eugenics and against the rule of the mob. It's a political system that's had considerable political appeal in the last several hundred years to, well, a handful of male aristocrats. And in a self-perpetuating worldview, to have been brainwashed in this elitist philosophy was what entitled you to political power, a political system imposed through aesthetics, perpetuated in the name of art and philosophy. Greece can claim to be strongly represented, if represented is not too weak a word, in the architecture, sculpture and painting of Europe up to at least the beginning of the 20th century. Although we will differentiate between Greek, Hellenistic and Roman versions of the classical, the Renaissance did not. Uh, the neoclassical period was a deliberate attempt to revive Greek classicism. The philosophy is inescapable. The French philosopher Pierre Bourdieu spoke of the tendency of art galleries to have steps that you ascend before entering under a classical temple portico, as though the gods and the political elite of the time and the aesthetic were one and the same. But there is a problem, and the problem is the hook. What makes the Athenian worldview so inescapable is their sincere appreciation, their impeccably rational understanding of beauty. As one commentator has said, the only ugly things you'll ever see are man-made. Nature is unconditionally beautiful. And the most important image in nature to a human being is another human being the human body. And the Greeks, in the space of a century, captured it to perfection. But how? In essence, they did in art what they miserably failed to do in science. We'll come back to that uh, problem two millennia later when we look at the 1600s in Europe. In art, they looked and they measured. In science, they didn't. In art, the canon of proportions was based on observation of nature. Chiasmata, the twisting of the shoulders and hips to put the weight of the body onto one leg, was inspired observation. Just as the enthesis, the thickening of columns in their middle to compensate for the glare of the sun behind them, and the illusion of perfection in the arms of the Artemision Zeus, which is created by their exaggerated length. The iliac muscle that rises with an impossible perpendicularity from the flesh speaks of an ideal of perfection. The Parthenon and its sculptures. And so to the apogee, arguably the greatest achievement in Greek art and the most controversial surviving artifact, the Parthenon sculptures. We'll look at them in the chronological order in which they were made, the metopes, the frieze and the pediments, and also at how they were made and in what context, and what they meant. The Parthenon, the temple of Athena Parthenon, Athena the Virgin, on the Acropolis, next to the colossal bronze sculpture of Athena Promachos, warrior in the front rank, had a coloured and ultimately a tragic history. 
literally coloured because it was painted in bright colours, figuratively coloured because it became a church and then a mosque. Tragic because the Ottomans used it as a gunpowder store which the Venetians bombarded. Tragic also that Lord Elgin was able to plunder the site. The Metopes were the first works executed. They were a testing ground for the artists and contain a wide range of skill from the rigid and hieratic to the brilliantly naturalistic and composed. This tomb sculpture of average quality in the British Museum is the perfect showcase for sculpting techniques in the classical world. Many of these tools were inherited from the Egyptians and handed down to the present day. There's a link to a very interesting video on Moodle um, by Peter Rockwell, who's the son of uh, the illustrator Norman Rockwell, and it's about sculpting tools. Um, you would take out volume, take off the corners of any uh, block with the punch chisel, then you'd mould the surface down to the right uh, topology with the claw. Uh, incidentally, the Bargello uh, Museum in Florence has um, all of Michelangelo's unfinished sculptures, and they've been abandoned at this stage, covered in striations, sort of uh, scratched stripes from the, the claw chisel. Uh, then you would flatten uh, those uh, scratches with the round chisel, and then smooth it down with a flat chisel, then polish it uh, with a rasp, and finally pumice stone. The drill is used for making holes, and it's operated like a, a fire bow, with one person pulling on the strings and the other one pushing it down into the stone. Uh, these holes um, could have been spaced apart and then joined together with a chisel to make a deep trench in the stone quite quickly. What tools were used? here. I'm going to start exploring the imagery of the frieze in a slightly unusual way. There are whole television shows dedicated to showing mistakes in films and I think it's important to remember that the image of perfection that films present is in fact a fiction. And in the same way, the idea of the Parthenon as an ideal, as a perfect work of art, is also a bit of a fiction. We're going to look at some of the mistakes, just to remind ourselves that it is a physical work, that it was made by many hands. In this image, we can actually see a mistake in that, as I said earlier, the drill would have been used to make a series of holes which were then easily uh, connected with a chisel to take out large amounts of space. But in this image we can see that the person drilling those holes went in too deep, beyond the intended level of the freeze. Now a mistake such as this would have been filled in with dust and glue and would have been invisible, but uh, the truth uh, will out over time as will dust and glue. These uh, mistakes were actually on Zeus's wife in the most important part of the frieze. Uh, these holes are not actually mistakes. They would have held harnesses. These chisel marks um, would not have been noticed at the time when the frieze was in situ. It would have been eight meters above head height. The title here, Pentimento, means I've changed my mind. Uh, I need to move the horse and turn it into a cloak. I hope it works. Uh, if your hands get tired, uh, no need to really chisel in the detail in the horse's manes. Um, the, the painters who are going to come later to decorate the frieze can actually do that. They needed to flatten this head actually uh, to, to fit it in. I love these imperfections. There are also some famous marks on the back of one of the pedimental sculptures, where a workman has tested his brush and paint with one stroke 2,450 years ago. They don't detract from the overall wonder of this piece, and they're testament to the workmen who came from far and wide to work on the piece, some possibly from having worked in Persia. 
Now to another tragedy um, which befell the, the Parthenon freeze, the Duveen tragedy of 1938. Uh, already in the British Museum, uh, Lord Joseph Duveen, who built the room that houses the freeze today, was obsessed by the idea of the pure whiteness of the marbles and he pressurised British Museum workmen to chisel off the surface of many of the marbles to make them whiter. Uh, tragedy or absurd drama when you consider that the entire frieze was originally intended to be polychromatic, painted with bright colours. Evidence of this remains in the form of the mildly radioactive Egyptian blue paint uh, used on the belt of iris on the pediment sculpture. And Marx left from a chemical reaction with the original paint, a uh, test of the original decoration. It's not actually the original paint, um, but a residue left behind when the paint reacted with the marble. This is a famous Victorian artist's impression of the polychrome painting. What is the Parthenon freeze? Well, it's a bas relief, or bas relief, meaning low relief sculpture. Uh, rather like a slightly three-dimensional drawing, as opposed to high relief, which may have elements which project away from the surface, separate sculptures. We'll compare to the Pergamon sculptures later. The frieze runs around the outside of the building, which is in the centre of the temple, uh, composed of the cella and the naos. The frieze is at the top of a 10.5 metre wall. So seen in Di Sotto in Sum perspective, that's from below looking upwards. Um, it was believed that with the roof on they would have been virtually unreadable, a bit of a mystery, uh, and therefore perhaps just represented a kind of aesthetic tribute to the gods. But recent reconstruction work um, involved putting boards down uh, which mimicked the original ceiling, and uh, apparently the intense Aegean fill light reflected off the floor created a subtle illumination which worked very well and made the frieze quite readable. The frieze represents a procession, starting in the southwest corner and working in duplicate along both sides to the east of the building, um, which is the entrance to the temple where the Chris Elephantine statue of Athena Parthenos was. Chris Elephantine meaning ivory and gold, and that statue was also made by Phaedias who was the um, episcopos, the overseer of the whole project of the Parthenon. So the procession starts uh, in the southwest and uh, there's, there's a duplicate going along the south and then from that southwest the other version goes north along the west face and then along the north edge and they both meet uh, on the east face. The procession that it depicts was very probably the Panathenaia, the celebration of Athena Parthenos' birthday on August the 13th or perhaps June the 8th, um, although we'll look at some alternative interpretations in a while. It starts um, with the inspection of horses outside the Diplon, the double gate uh, entrance to Athens. Um, the inspection of horses were called, was called the Dokimasia. Uh, then um, continuing through the Dipylon, all the horses that were chosen would uh, take part in a cavalcade. We can actually see in the Dokimasia there's someone holding their hand up and it's believed that that person would have been holding up a brand to brand with an X the cheek of uh, horses which weren't considered good enough to take part. And there's a horse that appears to be rubbing its cheek. Um, and it's been argued that this represents a horse that's been rejected, branded on the cheek and rejected from the procession. The cavalcade then continued to the open area in the centre of Athens, the Agora, uh, before it proceeded on foot to the Acropolis for sacrifices. And uh, we can see in the Agora there's something called the Apobatai, the chariot contest in which um, people in the chariot, um, which was driven by a separate uh, charioteer, would have to jump off and back on the chariot as it was moving. 
Um, this wasn't really strategy. It wasn't really military strategy. It was more a kind of tribute to um, a way of doing war in days gone by, because actually open chariot warfare wasn't something that the Greeks did in the 5th century um, BC. Um, as I say, the procession then moves up to <clears throat> the Acropolis, and we can see uh, people carrying things for the sacrifice. We've got trays of special delicacies which would have attracted the uh, animals to the altar to be sacrificed. They had to go willingly. Um, we've also got um, the Oenokri, people carrying large um, vases of wine. And as I say, finally the whole procession meets on the east um, where the Olympian gods are waiting. So what do we know about the intention of Pericles, the political leader of Rome at the time? And his master sculptor and designer, Phaedias, the architect was a separate designer, Calipatris. Um, we've yet to look at the iconography as a whole, including the metopes and pediments. The metopes on the west front show the Amazonomachy, which is the battle between Athens' mythical founder, Theseus, uh, fighting the Amazons of the Black Sea. And the geography is quite important. We'll come back to that in a second. On the north, we've got the depiction of Troy. Um, so a Greek expedition to besiege a city on um, territory which is now Turkey. On the south side, uh, the metopes which Elgin removed uh, represent the fight between the centaurs and the lapis. Uh, it's where the Lapiths, humans, um, had a wedding which the centaurs gate crashed. The centaurs got drunk and the animal part of themselves couldn't control uh, themselves and uh, it developed into a fight. Um, so there's representation of that fisticuffs or hoofy cuffs um, in these metopes. What are the metopes? The metopes are square blocks which went all the way around the outside of the building and they were separated by uh, triglyphs. Triglyphs are the, the three vertical bars which represented um, rafters, projecting rafters um, from when temples were made of wood and here they're just represent, represented in stone to continue that tradition. In the east, we have the Gigantomachy, which is essentially the last stage of the great battle between um, the Olympian gods, who were the uh, pantheon of gods for the Greeks, and um, the uh, their enemies, the Titans, who sent the giants to try and defeat the Olympians, and the Olympians were successful. There's something in a common theme between all these metopes which will inform our reading of the uh, temple as a whole. And we need to look at context to do that. So, uh, in short, um, if you want the really long version, you can read Herodotus Histories, which describes the whole of this um, part of Athenian history. Um, there's a celebration of the West Athens, uh, the Hellenic world, defeating the East, Turkey, in the Metopes, in all four sides. Why? Well, let's look at the historical context. When we left Mesopotamia around 500 BC, the Assyrian Empire had collapsed, and in the power vacuum that it left behind arose the Persian Empire, copying a lot of the temple, um, the, sorry, the palace uh, friezes that ran around the Assyrian temples. The Persians copied that style very closely. Um, and at about the same time that Athens was killing its tyrants and starting its uh, democracy, uh, the Persian Empire started to expand east into the Mediterranean coast of Turkey. Uh, and at that time it was occupied by Greek colonies. Um, conflict arose. The first Persian attempt um, to defeat the Greeks Darius's armies were squeezed off the beach at Marathon by the Athenians and the Thespians. Ten years later, his son Xerxes 
returned by land and sea. His land troops were delayed at Thermopylae by the Spartans uh, in a famous battle, long enough for the Athenians to ready their fleet for the naval victory at Salamis and then another victory on land at Plataea. The Athenians, uh, as victors, formed the Delian League, where the other city-states had to pay for the upkeep of the Athenian fleet as a defence against Persian invasion. Pericles, however, the politician, leader of Athens, decided that the Athenians were free to spend the money as they saw fit on the glory of Athens and used the money to build the Parthenon from 448 to 432 BC. And they filled the front chamber of the Parthenon with all the gold that was left over. Uh, this didn't end well for the Athenians, but that's another story. Here is arguably the most important section of the frieze, most of which is in London. It's the seated pantheon, uh, all the gods, beautifully characterised. Uh, here we have uh, Hermes, the messenger. Uh, for the Romans, that would be adapted to become Mercury. Uh, he has a, a sun hat called a petassos because he, he would spend so much time uh, outside um, delivering messages. And he also has his winged sandals that you can see there um, to fly between places. Next we have Dionysus, um, god of uh, wine. Uh, he's looking quite relaxed. And why not? Uh, then we have uh, Demeter. Uh, for the Romans that's Ceres. And she's uh, looking as though she's pining for her daughter Persephone, who's been abducted to the underworld. And we have Ares, uh, god of water, that's the Roman Mars, and he has a pose where he's quite ill at ease with just sitting around, um, or is he stretching his muscles, uh, getting ready uh, for the next battle. Then we have uh, Hera, um, she's veiled as Zeus's wife, that's Juno um, for the Romans. Then Zeus is the only person who gets a, a chair which has a back to it. And then this, this is what's called the peplos scene. Uh, now the peplos is the Athena's birthday present. Um, it's uh, woven um, with her gorgon emblem on it. So the Medusa's head. And it's dedicated to the statue in the Parthenon. So the end aim of the Panathenaic procession would be to go into the temple and lay this peplos at the feet of the gold and ivory statue. Um, here's Athena um, and with her is Hephaestus, uh, for the Romans that was Vulcan, um, god of uh, metallurgy among other things and he's he's actually uh, on crutches uh, both for the Romans and for the Greeks. Uh, then we have Poseidon, his trident would have been painted in so he doesn't appear to be holding up anything here. Um, there's something strange going on, though, with all of this. The gods seem to be completely uninterested in the peplos scene. The focal point of this whole procession, the reason why the gods are assembled here, and no one's looking at it. Now, there's a really interesting theory, um, quite an obscure theory, on why this is the case and it's the theory that essentially this flat freeze is an attempt at a representation of three-dimensional space on uh, a two-dimensional surface and that's a phenomenon that's not unknown in Greek art you can find three-dimensional representations so for example if we look at this Greek urn this ancient Greek urn which raises the question what's an ancient Greek urn Okay, I won't do that one. Um, and on this urn, you can see the seat has been foreshortened. Now, foreshortened means that as uh, a line points towards the eye of the viewer, it becomes shortened. And another interesting fact is that at the end of the procession, the empty seats uh, representing the gods would have been placed on the dais of the temple um, to symbolize their presence. Now, if that semicircle is represented 
on the freeze, that would then explain this uh, attendant and who he's signaling to. Um, now, in the flat two-dimensional idea, he, he seems to be signaling. There's no one that seems to be there to receive his signal. But as we turn the two sides round, he could be signaling to someone on the other side of the semicircle who's much closer to him now. Uh, alternative theories abound um, on the interpretation of the um, s the freeze, uh, other than this idea of the Panathenaic procession, and all of them have their inconsistencies. But it's the job of our historians to to challenge existing theories and, and come up with new ones. Looking at the pediments, they're in common with the themes that we've already seen. This idea of Athenian pride. On the west pediment, the one facing the sea, uh, which you'd first see as you come up the Acropolis through the um, Propylia, the gateway, you've got the contest between Poseidon donating salt from the sea and Athena with a gift of an olive tree representing the land. And it's a competition to see who will be the patron of the city, Athens. Obviously, Athena wins. Um, on the east front, uh, pediment, we've got the birth of Athena. It's the result of Zeus eating one of his own offspring to try and hide his infidelity from his wife, um, which prompted a, a headache. And Hephaestus, the uh, Greek um, god that would be interpreted as Vulcan by the Romans, comes along with his hammer and cures Zeus's headache by splitting open Zeus's head with his hammer. And Athena springs forth from Zeus's head fully armed and ready for battle. It could have happened. In terms of the enduring influence of the Greek idea of beauty in the accompanying political system, we can see a re recurring resurrection of this Hellenic spirit down the following 24 centuries. And it's something we're going to examine in the rest of this course.